Off top, koalas are believed to be amongst the dumbest animals in the animal kingdom. Apparently, they won't eat eucalyptus leaves unless they are on their branches. Mm-hmm. Play the music. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show. Welcome to the Dominique Foxworth Show. Oh, we're recording this after we already recorded the show, and this one is a beast. I am sitting here with my guy, co-host and producer, Charlie the Koala Kravitz. Been told I look like a koala many times. <laughs> yeah, he's not dumb, though. He's very smart, and we love him. He's still the snack. Koalas are cute. That's somebody hitting on you if they say you like koala, right? Yeah, I mean, it was another dude. Oh, they can hit on you, too. That's true, yeah. All right, Kevin Clark, join us. All right, let's welcome in our good friend, Kevin Clark, the star of the Vegas live show, the most <laughs> hand movie man around. The yep. what, what are the shoes that you had on? All uh, birds. Oh, the king of all birds. Mm. The thing, the thing I want to make the clear is I had them God. on. I had the all birds on because I was doing like twelve hours of filming. You should try it. And I just needed to be comfortable. It's not a judgment. I was sta- just statement. I just fact. wouldn't. I was if I up. was like doing a live show, and if I was like orchestrating it the way I wanted, I would. I would not have worn ninety dollar like office don't be, shoes. Don't be ashamed. Worker office shoes. I am ashamed. Sh- I'm a little ashamed. ashamed. If you were, if you were ashamed, you'd have brought some fresher kicks. It's okay. Just embrace the fact that you're a dad now. You're fully. You got on a golf hat. You're the type of guy I, who buys shoes for comfort, not for style. Ain't nothing wrong with that. I have nicer shoes. I will say, I thought because they were unmarked, I thought because they were unmarked, I thought that no, I would get away with it. And everybody in the comments was like, "All birds, like what are you doing?" Are like you someone so literally man. tweeted at me. I, I don't even know this person. Hold they on. tweeted at me and they Deep just said, breath, man. You're like they you're, said, you were obviously not the cool kid in high school because it's all flooding back in right now. You're just getting all defensive. I relaxed. was actually pretty cool. <laughs> I've regressed. I've regressed. <laughs> This is why I'm upset. I've regressed. It's okay. And now it's okay. someone said to me that all birds are the universal sign that I don't know ball. <laughs> Which is, I don't even know why they would think that. It's not like coaches oh. have any swag. Um, I, I mean, coaches guys- just wear the shoes that are given to them. But relax. It's all right. You was holding it down for the kitchen workers. Nothing's wrong with that. And the nurses, you know, nurses, you got on nurse shoes. Relax. Uh-huh. You got a demo? You was holding it down Darn for nurse well. shoes. Barnwell was also wearing all birds. No, I no, see, there now there we can't. <laughs> no, except the thing is, Barnwell is securing himself, and he doesn't need to come on here and defend himself. You was rocking nurse shoes. It's okay. Nurses are wonderful um, people. For the record, all birds, if you want to sponsor this podcast, we're open for business. We will yeah. wear all birds on we air are, every show. I was just, them to I us. was exalting the praises of all birds. They don't they like? Oh no, that's Tom's that gives shoes that's to people, Tom's. right? Yeah. Also open for I business say, from Tom's. <laughs> I, I, I entered a new zone, Charlie, recently, and I bought, and I'm deeply ashamed to say this, I bought Allbird golf shoes. Don't be ashamed. You're not ashamed because you told us. I'm happy for you. Pr- I'm proud of you. Just be who hey, you are. Can I tell you what I am ashamed of? So I just spent the last 15 minutes because the college football video game is back. Oh, yeah. um, I spent the last 15 minutes trying to find Dominique Foxworth's rating. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't find it anywhere. I, I was downloading rosters. And now I think I was downloading like five zip files. I think I had like 10 viruses. Because I was downloading. I was <laughs> Is that why your mic didn't work? Dregs. <laughs> yes. I, I was in the absolute dregs of the internet downloading NCAA 05. Because your last season was season You could just ask me. Oh, like fi- this well, goes well, back well, to the time when you guys like tried to insult me by saying I wasn't a five star. And I obviously was. That, you were not. But then. <laughs> I was. Uh, I was I never found out the rating and then I was rewarded because the only thing I found was the 99 club and only four players that year were 99s and one of them was Marcus Spears. Oh mm. wow, mm. what a monster! Mm. Yeah, I was 96. All right, moving on. What no, was your no, right? oh, no come way. on. Were you I mean, really in college? 96? In college, yeah. I don't have to lie. This again, you thought I was lying about the five star. 96, thing. Is, 96 has... is really high in video games. Yeah, I yes. agree. I, anybody- <laughs> I actually talked about this with Bomani on his show earlier today. I was better in the game than I was in real football. Oh, you probably had high, like, the mesh, the speed, too. You're probably, like, 98 on speed actually, acceleration. No, I wasn't. I wasn't that fast. I just had a really good my, – my freshman season was really good, and then my sophomore season I had six <clears throat> picks. So, like, mm-hmm. they don't do the yeah. – um, the way that they analyze the NFL players is – 
they don't do that for college players. So I had I came on the scene as a true freshman, played really well in the final game. Then the following year, I had six picks and was like one uh, mm -hmm. in the conversation for the defensive back of the year. Then they're like, all right, guess he's good. Ninety six, and that was that. That's sick. Yeah, that's fine. You should you should lead with that more often. <laughs> See, this it's not it's nothing to be <clears throat> impressed about. It's embarrassing. Anyway, I was trying to hype up. It's embarrassing when you when you start telling people things from a long time ago. It's like you know you have that friend who like yeah. made all metro, <laughs> all yeah. city, and it's like ten years later, and their their Facebook profile is like all city. Like I'm never gonna be that guy. I'm on to the next thing. If if Pablo Torre got a 96 on anything, he would tell you, <laughs> and none of them are as cool as the thing that you actually got a 96 on. Anyway, welcome Kevin Clark, the king hey, of all birds, the lord of the name drop, the anecdote anecdote god. Kevin Clark, you got a story for us? I mean, I just had a pretty good story about getting 10 viruses on my computer. <laughs> yeah, that's good enough. All right, we're done with stories. What are we talking about? Uh, today? We're going to end with a Vegas story. You're going to tell us our oh. favorite, our favorite oh, thing that we boy. did in Vegas. Oh, boy. Um, so we're going we're gonna to talk some football today. Let's do it. We're heading into the combine. We're heading into NFL free agency. Draft season, off season's upon us. I want to play a game. Oh, let do it. We're going to be GMs for a day. We're going to drop our media cap. And we're going to try to make the decisions, the tough decisions, that a lot of teams have to face this offseason. The first one is looming off, um, or it's coming off of the Super Bowl. The runner-up, San Francisco 49ers, they have some roster decisions as things are going to shake out over the next year whenever they have to pay back Brock Purdy, what they're going to do with Brandon Ayuk in particular, who was a second-team All-Pro. He was an elite, whether you want to call him the number one or number two receiver, I think that mm -hmm. depends on how you're going to look at it. He wasn't happy with his target share in the Super Bowl. He might not be happy in San Francisco. They're going to have to pay Brandon Ayuk this offseason. So my question, if you guys were the GM of the 49ers, would you pay Brandon Ayuk or would you try to trade him for a first-round pick and do what they've done, which is find talent in the spots where they have draft picks? Yeah, I mean, I think the – you give me the GM hat, it makes me want to do GM things. Yeah. <laughs> and the GM thing is to believe that you can find – a uh, suitable or better replacement in the draft and get the value for the player now. Um, and that's where my immediate thought goes to, to do that. And given the like structure of this offense and the amount of talent that they have and the uniqueness of it, having like a true X that you put over there by himself and he commands attention doesn't seem like this offense is constructed around really needing that as much as we saw it take off when they got a true like star running back, which is ironic because the history of the Shanahan offense was you don't need a star running back. Right. Uh, you can make it work, but it does seem like there's some value to it. So I think we'll have the conversation, but I think my starting place is, especially considering how good this year's receiving draft class is and how many mm -hmm. great receivers it feels like coming to the draft or coming to the league every single year, just feels like you have to look for them. You can find them. I think I would move on from Ayuk. What do you think, Kevin? So the Niners have done this before with DeForest Buckner mm -hmm. at a different position um, where they traded him because he was getting expensive. They chose Eric Armstead, and that, that kind of makes sense. They chose, and it was a different timeline, but like they've given Debo Samuel a ton of money. They, they bet big on him. He's a different type of player. It was funny because ESPN Analytics does this thing where they do open gods versus yak gods and all this stuff, and Ayuk was the most open guy in the league this year and Debo Samuel was the best yards after catch guy. And I asked some of our analytics folks, I said, what's better? And they said, it's way better to be open. Like that's repeatable. That's, you know, kind of defense proof. Like you want to be able to, to just be open all the time. Ayuk last year was the best player in the NFL on a per target basis, catching the ball um, among players who had 700 snaps. Khalil Shakir actually was better if you go 600 snaps, but um, he's a, a medium threat in an offense that um, I think at some point, if you just keep trusting the system, um, it will it will break. Shanahan can create a lot of offense, but at some point you're you're helping the quarterback out. Um, you have just a bunch of premium position pieces everywhere, and you don't want to really find out if Ayuk was was thirty percent, forty percent, whatever it is of this offense. And so I would try to pay him as much as humanly possible. The ideal you mentioned the the GM stuff, which is trading a guy and then being like, all right, we'll replace him in the draft. Well, first of all, it depends what kind 
kind of pick. It sounds like they wanted a, a top 12 pick for Debo a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. They didn't get it. Maybe they had that sort of line in the sand this year. Um, but the, the ideal is like what the, the Vikings do, where they trade Stephon Diggs and they draft Justin Jefferson that same year. Like, that's the ideal. That's really hard to do. And and the idea, even in this, this era where receivers are, are easier to come by, there are still busts. And all it takes is for, like, the Niners already overcame the worst trade of the decade, but when they traded three first round picks with Trey Lance, he did nothing mm. for them. They made the Super Bowl anyway. Second but I, at Watson. some point, at some point, there's going to be a fall. I would just pay IU and figure the rest out later. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the hard part. And so, like, that's easy to say, I guess, but the hard part is to figure the rest out later. There's there's a chance that IU is, or not a chance, he is benefiting from this system also. And if you're not going to change the system. Uh, in order to showcase this guy, what he is going to cost them will require you to make some, the figuring it out later is actually losing players and uh, players that you might need. So I guess the question is not, it's less, it becomes less about IU specific and more about a team philosophy. And where do you think that you can replace? The rookie receiver thing I think is probably maybe even harder for them to do because of like the narrow splits and the amount of blocking. Like I saw yeah. IU lead block on run plays yep. before. And they're like things that this offense requires of their receivers that might be harder to find. However, if you're looking at, yeah, I, I guess the point I'm making is how important is a true number one receiver in this offense since they don't treat him like one. Right. So like, would it be, would you have to restructure the way that you play if you're going to pay him that way because you're going to lose elsewhere because they haven't had to? And, like, I understand the Debo situation, but Debo, mm -hmm. uh, he creates problems and dilemmas even when he's not catching the ball just with the defensive personnel that gives you a bit of an advantage. Sure, Ayuk was a lot of go balls, um, but it was, like, the the system fit, as you said, I think he was the number one graded run blocker at the receiver position this year. Right. Um, that's something in that offense, as as you mentioned. Um, I think it just comes down to first of all, like I guess Trent Williams can restructure. They can they can open up like seventeen million dollars of cap space just that way. There's a bunch of good players whose number cap number can come down, so it's not like a dire situation. It's not like the damn Chargers or like the Saints are in every single year. They have room to work with it. It's about how much they value having those pieces you're already paying Debo you're already paying Kittle and now you have to pay Ayuk I think it comes down to the same thing I've always said about these types of offensive gurus which is you get them in the room get all the recording devices out close the door and say how many guys can you do this with and if the answer is we can take the kid from LSU and you know with a with a top 10 pick or yeah. whatever I mean again it depends what you get the in return but if you can trade up and get a stud like that and he can replace you fine do that but I, I just don't know who's trading a top half of the first round pick for Brandon Ayuk other I I, yeah no I that's think fine I, I think commanded more yeah I think you probably won't get a top half but I think it, well that's a whole nother conversation but I think the other thing that John Lynch has to consider is the overall window right mm -hmm. it's like yeah if you think that you're close uh and this is the problem that the bills got into and I guess it's not a problem but it's like if you think that you're close you don't let any good players leave you keep and you and it's like how the the Rams have done it. They bounce back sooner than most people expect, but like you go all in. And I think that they still believe that they are close. And I guess the Bills is the counter example where it's like now the Bills, at least most of us think that because they have a quarterback they're going to be in it, but they're not going to be as talented as they have been in the past. And the 49ers are setting themselves up for the same thing without the superstar. Well, I don't want to start this debate, but without a Josh Ev Allen level quarterback. So to totally fair. Joe Burrow a couple of years ago said the window to win yeah. a championship is as long as he's there. And I think that's true. But I guess I would ask, are the Niners closer, relatively speaking, than they were a couple of years ago? Or is the window just as long as Kyle Shanahan is there? And is he going to be able to do this mm -hmm. in five or six years? Like the, the mistake I think teams get in is first of all like every team is all in all the time now every team that wants to win the super bowl they, they they push their chips like the rams doing it six years ago was a novelty like everybody's all in all the time now unless you're the cowboys and which you just draft and develop add one guy and you say that's good enough it's not good enough um we know what all in looks like i think that the way that the, the niners can operate here is push the limit with the cap but i don't think they've got some window that's going to close kyle shanahan took mr irrelevant and had him in the super bowl this year like I think they can sort of look at this window as 10, 15 years as long as Kyle Shanahan is there. I don't think they have to do moves to beat people. The problem I thought with the Bills approach was they they made moves, literally, Brandon Bean said this, Brandon Bean told me, that they made moves 
to generate pass rush against the Chiefs. Well, the problem is, is that you may not get to play the Chiefs. In fact, next year they didn't. Um, you may you may not get to to climb that mountain again. So you always have to operate from a position of how do we just maximize the roster and not mm -hmm. try to uh, try to go through one stage, which is beating the Chiefs. Like I just when you, when you start locking in on one target, you might you might there might be dangers lurking all around that that you don't anticipate. Yeah, I mean, I get why Brandon Bean would say that now, but it's it's about like sports and life in general. It's about like playing the probabilities. It's probably pretty smart to prepare for playing in the Chiefs. I'm not going to go as far as you, and I assume that you didn't mean this abs in an absolute way, where it's like you don't have to consider what your opponents or what your opposition no. is. I think it's wise to like if you are going up against, you have to face – Debo all the time you need a corner who can tackle and it's also right. comfortable like these are reasonable considerations to make when you're going forward you can't just make your team in a vacuum the best team in the 90s will not be the best team today because like size and speed of the game so I, I don't know I get your point but I think to some degree had Brandon Bean won one of these championships which is completely possible he would be like you know what made this happen that we drafted to get past Russell the Chiefs. It's just like fluky in how this oh. stuff works sometimes. I think you have to play the probabilities. Like a ton of offenses adjusted to the Pete Carroll cover three because right. that was everywhere a decade ago. I think that's fine. But I think you're saying like, oh, we're going to draft this linebacker because he can stay with Patrick Mahomes. Well, then what happens when, you know, I guess Lamar Jackson would be a, a similar sort of equation, just a, a fast, instinctual guy. But like, I, what happens when you play Joe Burrow for the next year? Um, it's just, I think you just have to, draft and 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 make moves towards what is going to win you the most games yeah. and then okay. and then hope you get the draw this well, is a, this I, I feel like charlie can feel us getting into a a wheezy conversation that maybe people won't enjoy but we'll have to do this offline i guess because i i don't know that i agree with you or brandon bean honestly it's like yeah is it you want to draft to make your team the best team possible but it's it's not a video game in that the ratings are like this guy's an 80, this guy's a 90. No, there are guys who are 80s and 90s at different things. And different things are important depending on what you're going up against. So I think it's completely fair. So, yeah, maybe you don't want to draft one guy for one game. But I think it's smart if you're looking at the Chiefs, who we know you're going to have to get back past them at some point. It's much smarter to draft in anticipation for that than like, oh, I like this guy. So is he going to work? He's going to get played off the court like a clumsy center. So the only thing who, I was going to add. Who drafted you because you were a 96? Um, uh, was it Shanahan? Mike Shanahan. and um, he, saw, he saw the 96. Kyle was probably playing on the yeah, sticks. Yeah, that's probably what like, happened. He's like, hey. 96. Yeah, I, I think, honestly, they just drafted all the corners that were available. The first three <laughs> draft picks. Because, to your point, they were drafting for Peyton Manning. And we lost the, the my rookie year. We lost in the AFC Championship game to the Steelers because we did not even get to see Peyton Manning. So, you're right. You win. Next topic. Okay. All I was going to say was uh, Brandon Ayuk also might be the safest health bet for that team because mm -hmm. otherwise you're investing in 32-year-old yeah. George Kittle, Debo, who's had an injury history, and McCaffrey, although he's been healthy for the year and a half, he's been in San Francisco, has been banged up in the past. So that you develop that guy. He started in Kyle Shanahan's doghouse and then worked his way out into becoming a star receiver. Might not be that easy to replace unless you get a Malik Neighbors who in any other draft outside of Marvin Harrison Jr. would be the top guy. Um, all right, next one. Let's move to one of the most interesting teams, I think, going into next season, which is the Texans. There are rumors in the streets that Saquon Barkley wants to be a Texan. If you were the Texans, would you sign Saquon Barkley? And would you view that as a move that drastically changes the ceiling of your team? Yeah. Am I going first here? Um, sure, why not? It doesn't drastically change the ceiling. I think they need a number one receiver. Um, I think if if one of the T Higgins of the world who we're going to talk about, I think in a second, if an Ayuk became available, I'd be in that sweepstakes. What I think I, the reason like Mike Tannenbaum was on my show a couple months ago and he was talking about how he would have paid Saquon first because the locker room has a, it appears the locker room has a lot more respect in, in New York for Saquon than it does for Daniel Jones. And once you sign Daniel Jones, Saquon's upset the entire locker room. Like, you guys saw the Kayvon Thibodeau viral clip where he's staring into the camera like Jim Halpert when mm -hmm. talking about Daniel Jones coming back next year. Like, and there's a lot of confidence there. Players love having Saquon there, and he's still good. He's still got it. And I just think that at some point, running backs become a value as long as they're going to be healthy, as, they're, as long as they're going to be on the field. You don't have to pay them very much money. And so if the market kind of bottoms out on Saquon, I would add him, but he's not kind of priority one on my on my board. 
Yeah, um, I think drastically is an interesting thing there because I think it has the potential to do so. And the team that we were just talking about is the example that you point to. And I guess the difference is the team being the 49ers when they mm-hmm. acquire Christian McCaffrey, we see how this team team changes. And maybe the difference is the um, Texans have a quarterback that uh, is better, frankly. Uh, and they have an offense that is, while it is still a uh, derivative of Shanahan – it's like true drop back potential and ability with the quarterback and two receivers that when healthy, I guess not like top 10 in the league, but I'm not even sure that a true number one would be necessary. But I think the dynamic that Saquon adds to the offense is important and impressive because not only can he turn uh, three yards into five yards, which turns third and eight to, I mean, third and seven to third and five, which is different pressure on the quarterback, but I think he can make home run plays. And he also provides a, a, a matchup dynamic that takes a bunch of attention off of, or, or forces attention on him and makes it easier for everyone else. So I don't know if there is one player that, and I honestly don't know that a true number one receiver, given the fact that they have Nico and Tank, uh, I don't know that a true number one receiver would have as much of an impact as Saquon because he takes pressure off the offensive line mm-hmm. and he provides home run plays, which is something that we don't take into as much account, I don't think, when we're talking about players like Saquon in that you don't have the game plan for a whole drive. There's some drives that Saquon just going to take it 30 and <laughs> drives over. You don't have to figure anything out because he's that special. So I guess to your point, I, I don't know that I agree that it's like a, a drastic change, but I don't agree that it can't be. Like, I feel like it could be in the right situation. They bring back They uh, also, they, they need linebackers. They need linebackers. Defense. They need uh, defense. And that's what they should prioritize before. Like, Saquon is a good add if they have the money left over. I just, there's so many more. Like, kind of, again, what we're talking about, Foxworth, where it's like, what what is their goal? Is their goal to get better on offense? Or is their goal to win a playoff game this year and, it, and next year? And if it is win a playoff game, then it's like three pieces on defense before we even start on the offense. Um. Was 2004 your last year of college football? Uh, I think so. Okay, you were in 91. Right, 2005. No, How two, did you no, find that? That's a 2004 <laughs> roster. Right, the game comes out in 2005. Wait, was it NCAA 05 or 04? This is 04. The game comes then, out. Then no, he had one more year. Yeah, he stayed an extra year to get five more points. Yeah. Okay, well, we're going to... This is how you've been spending your time. Yeah, you noticed I wasn't piping in on the Saquon yeah. topic. Well, I'll be Sorry, back. I'll get the five one. So is, is ninety one not cool enough as a junior? That doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. Just I thought it was just, I was just saying you were excellent in the game, but right, cool. Could you All have right. come out your junior year? Like, uh, could you? Have, I mean, I guess I could have. I think the problem was you. You said that I was fast. People didn't think I was fast. No, you were only a ninety two on the. Right. I know yeah. that's what I was saying. I, I was not considered a fast player until I went to the combine. So my combine. Um, you know, you get the pre-draft grade. My mm-hmm. pre-draft grade said I was a third rounder, so I went back to school to inevitably be a third rounder the following year. So uh, I don't think that it, that I could have come out, or I would have. Um, yeah, I don't know. Saquon is interesting. He's a good player. I don't know that there's any more of that. What's next? No, so I was just going to say the one thing on Saquon that I do find interesting is, like, I think people see a Shanahan scheme and imagine that you it, insert star running back and catch right. the ball, and he's going to be McCaffrey, but – is it? I feel like we're sort of overrating Saquon because of the name and underrating McCaffrey for reasons in thinking about that. That's possible. I mean, if Saquon does come with the name, but um, what is what does McCaffrey do? I guess you think he's a better route runner, or like, I think he's a more consistent runner of the yeah. football. Yeah, too. Saquon's like, a boom and yeah. bust, uh, a boom or bust type of back, or he has been historically, right? It's like yeah. big plays. Yeah, that's a fair point. He's better than who they have. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so, yeah. And I think he's an impact player. Saying that he's going to have the same impact as Christian McCaffrey is probably. A stretch, but adding him to what they have makes them a better football team, unquestionably. You were a 93 in 2005. Ah, damn it. Oh, very good. You were the you were the sixth best cornerback in college football based on that. I think was number six on Miami. Is that Antrell Roll? Yeah. He Mm -hmm. was the top guy in that game. He was a 97. I love Antrell Roll as a person, but I was so pissed when people were talking about him as a corner, like he's not going to play corner in NFL. That man is enormous. He was big as Greg Jones playing corner. And mm-hmm. eventually they moved him to safety. Do you remember that Greg Jones hit? Of course. Everyone remembers it. The on best. Dexter. Uh, yeah. You talking about the one? Yeah. yeah the not, the yeah. forearm where he knocked his helmet yeah, off yeah, and he banged him to the other guy. That was awesome. It was not awesome. It was... as, a, as a defensive back who had to play against Greg Jones. Not awesome. Mm-hmm.
Anyway, what's next? Um, I want to circle back to receivers for a second because this right. is a this is something probably should have gone coming right after Brandon Ayuk, but whatever because it's a different situation. Yeah, we gotta get a better producer. Yeah, seriously. More organized. <laughs> I, I got my producer is not a ninety three guys. I'll have you know. It's the problem is is that I got too distracted by. <laughs> <laughs> no excuses. We don't make excuses around here. Doc. Acc- accountability for the locker room. Yeah, my out. bad. Doc. My bad. My bad. No excuses. Doc. Doc. Yeah. Spit okay. it out. Um, let's go to the Bengals for a situation I for a second. In front of Kevin. Yeah, I mean, happy birthday. Um, if you were the GM of the, if you were the GM of the Bengals, would you pay T. Higgins or trade him for a draft pick? Oh man, uh, oh, different situation. They yeah. need different things. It's a very different situation. Um, I hate not paying anyone. My answer to all questions: He's going to get paid. Him. He's going to get yeah. paid, but just no, no, maybe no. not by them. I get it. He's going. To, I mean, they could also franchise him and find other ways to keep him around. They're going to have to if yeah they're going to have to move on from him at some point. I pay him, I'd pay him, and I'd keep trying to push the way that we are pushing. I know uh, Kevin's going to disagree because they have a true number no. one. You're not? No, I'm not. So oh. I was looking. I was looking at some of the like the advanced stuff earlier today, like the next. <clears throat> excuse me. Sorry. I was looking at advanced stuff too. Oh, fail. Sorry. Three, two, one. Uh, I was looking at advanced stuff. Are you counting today, like, like, like we're going to edit that? Next no, we leave it all. No, I'm just very hoarse. Oh, I'm very hoarse. Give me that three through what? So we get I was very on. hoarse because I was searching for your NCAA <laughs> rating. It took a lot out of me. <laughs> oh, man. All um, right. No, so <laughs> I, I was in Cincinnati a couple years ago. And I was doing that story on Joe Burrow's deep balls. And this coach, when I turned the tape recorder off, was like, don't make the story about Burrow only because this is like a special time. We're going to look back in like 10 years and be like, I cannot believe Jamar Chase and T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd were and Joe Mixon were, were all in the same offense. Like it's going to be like those those uh, Twitter videos that are circulating in the offseason. It's like this team was a problem. Yeah. Like it's that. And, <laughs> like um, Oklahoma City back in the yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or like uh, the, the Joe Burrow LSU team. Um, but Jamar Chase is a little better than T. Higgins, and they're different players. Jamar Chase is a little better than T. Higgins at everything. Um, T. Higgins has a little more depth on his routes. Jamar Chase has more short, short targets. But really, if you do like EPA per play, um, you know, catch rating, like all of this stuff, T. Higgins is just a little bit worse. And so normally I'd say, okay, he doesn't cut it. You pay Chase. Let's move on. But that's not the, the offense that they're in. Joe Burrow wants to get guys into routes. Vision is his superpower. And having four to five targets who are elite um, or three targets who are elite plus two just regular guys, that's how you win a Super Bowl. And so I would try to keep this, this core together. Um, and, and I, I would do whatever whatever it took. They have the pass rush on the other side locked in. That's fine. Um, they kind of robbed Peter to pay Paul last year by getting rid of, of Jesse Bates, letting him walk in for agency and, and replacing him in the draft. They could they could have gotten away with that if Burrow was healthy right. all year. I think you, you maintain the offensive core and everything else will work itself out. All right, three, two, one. When I think about building a team, this is something that uh, – like occurred to me a few years ago is that we often think about a, building a team like and this is kind of connected to the don't draft to go up against a certain opponent is you think about building a, building a team in the parts that you need but i found that what happens a lot of times in some of the best teams is they stockpile in one position mm-hmm. and when i want to be good is like you want to start the like the defensive rotation, if you think about in basketball terms, is you want something, if it's penetration, or if it's a player that's so good that it requires a double team, you want to have something out there that starts the rotation. And if it's one player, that's fine, and it's okay to be a position group. It's okay for a defense to have six great defensive linemen and then be mediocre at the second level or the third level because they have something that's so good that they can take pressure off of that and put it elsewhere. And that's what I view. That's how I view the T Higgins, Jamar Chase situation is that they don't have to look for something to make this balance. They have something that's so special that it makes life easier for everyone else. Mm -hmm. And taking that away, assuming that you can replace it or assuming that you can create a more balanced team, I don't know that that's the right move. Okay. Um, 
three, two, one. Um, <laughs> Jesus Christ. And, um, here's, here's the question coming off of this. Are they special enough that you can win in the NFL playing, paying your quarterback and your two wide receivers 30% of your cap? Because that's what it's going to be when Burrow, Chase, and Higgins are paid. So this is um, the cap percentage stuff. Like, it's relevant. I get it as a, as mm-hmm. a talking point. But bleep it. <laughs> like it's, it's what I, I mean, my feeling on that stuff is you pay the players that you need and yep. you figure out around. And this is the reason why I tend to not like that stuff is because it shifts the responsibility from the general manager and it shifts it on to the players like you're making all this money. And I, I, I um, am guilty of this, too. No, I know you're not yeah, saying yeah. that, but you're making all this money. Can you do all this stuff? Now that we expect it, like, no, they're making the money that, that they deserve. You know how you win Super Bowls is when you pay great players the money that yep. they deserve, and then you draft well. Mm-hmm. And you make acquisitions, and you stay healthy. So, like, I get the point that you're making, but it's not something that I think it should be universally applied. Yeah. Like, there's no rule for, we're, like— We're GMs for the day, though. Yeah. This is how as, we want to build our team. As a GM, that's how we want to build my team is, like, we will figure it out. Yep. <laughs> we got guys that can ball. Let's figure it out. I said I was going to figure it out with Ayuk earlier, and you jumped on me. Yeah, that's fine, because you said it. You, you don't say it with your chest. It doesn't sound as believable. <laughs> um, I will say most of the spending quirks, Charlie, mm-hmm. are, are just kind of like trivia to me. Yeah. Like A good example is for, for years, I think it was uh, the top two players in a team who won a Super Bowl never had combined for more than 20% of the cap. <laughs> and yeah. that was like true for some reason from the start of the salary cap until I think – the Chiefs against the Niners the last time um, they were the first team to do that. And I think Chris Jones had like the highest cap ever for a Super Bowl winner uh, in, in that year as well. It was crazy. But like Matt Ryan and Julio Jones combined for like 24 percent or something like that. That's not the reason they faded in the fourth <laughs> yeah, quarter. 28 right. to three. It wasn't like the salary cap gods were like, no, 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 no. We have to bring that back. Like you almost won it. And so I, I think that a lot of that stuff, the way you can restructure, the way you can find money, the way the cap is exploding. I mean, Dominique uh, was, the, was the head of the NFLPA when it started to climb $10 million a year from, what, 2011 oh, to 2020? Me. Yeah, all, all thanks to Dominique. Uh, and now it explodes every single year. And so I think a lot of the spending rules are us looking back and, and kind of making them up. I, I, I do think that you can kind of, uh, to, to borrow Dominique's phrase, figure it out. Yeah, absolutes are for children and dumb people. Um, I, I will say this also is the point that I think you were, one of the points that you were just making that I would like to steal from you and make it more clearly is that the cap percentage is what's happening in that year. Mm-hmm. Yes. You can see, so a player can have an enormous contract that is backloaded, and because they happen to be light on the early points of the contract, we're like, oh, well, you can't win. It's like, it's kind of a nonsense way to go about it anyway. Man, I love being right. Mm. Well done, Dominique. That was so much better. Thank you. Um, <laughs> all right. It was concise. Yeah. He didn't super- count in, so we have no idea. <laughs> yeah. I, is that in the show? Was that off? Was, was that off? <laughs> My bad. Three, two, one. Go, Charlie. All right, next one. Where this is sort of an NBA story that's an NFL story. Justin Fields unfollowed the Bears on Instagram and then said on I'm on Ross St. Brown's podcast, it's like, you know, do you always follow the girls you're messing with? It doesn't. Anyway. Um, so the Falcons are the bookmakers' favorites to land Justin Fields. The Falcons are also the bookmakers' favorites to land Baker Mayfield. If you were the GM of the Falcons, would you rather trade for Justin Fields, knowing that you're going to have to give up draft capital, or sign Baker Mayfield? The answer is yes. If you are committed to the girl that you're messing with, yes, you follow her. Like, that was a terrible analogy from Justin Fields. It was an awful analogy. Yeah, it's an awful analogy. So, I mean, he could have come up with something better, but that was not a good analogy because, yes, if you're committed to him. But the problem is, the pro- or for him, it's not a problem of how committed he is to this are, significant Are you really other. committed to someone if you're saying you're messing with them? No. The- I think that was – I think he was – Right. Well, the, I mean, there, yeah. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna let that one. Yeah, I'm gonna move on. Yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. I'm gonna three. I'm gonna three, two, one that. <laughs> okay. Well, the point. The point that I want to make is, it ain't up to him. Is the thing. So like, it's not that he ain't messing with them. They ain't messing yeah. with him. Yeah. And so to your question, who would you rather have as your quarterback? It's actually. Uh, not who would you rather have as your quarterback? The Falcons, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And, but it's yeah. also it's the acquisition method right. for it. Right. Oh yeah. So Baker Mayfield is a free agent, mm-hmm. um, and you would have to trade to acquire Justin Fields. Uh, mm-hmm. This is an easy question to lay out, a harder question to answer. 
the easy way to lay it out is we know how good Baker Mayfield can be, and it is above average, but it's not great. We know how bad Justin Fields can be, and we know how good we think he can potentially be. He could be great. He has not shown great. So that's the question is like, do you want the, the um, steadier? It's like the, <laughs> the classic question when you're talking about uh, athletic quarterbacks is like high ceiling, low floor, or steadier, which I guess the running gives them a higher floor. But you get the point. Justin Fields, we believe, yeah. has the capability to be a franchise-changing quarterback, even though he hasn't shown it yet. No one believes that of Baker Mayfield. Hmm. Um, or do you believe all, that of Baker Mayfield? No, no, no I don't. Right. Justin Fields is entering the last year of his contract, mm-hmm. so it's not like he's he's cross controlled for the next three years. You have to pay pay him at some point. You might have expectations of being paid as soon as he lands somewhere. Yeah. Um, you don't have to do that, but still, Justin Fields is the kind of player you should want to coach if you're an offensive coach because he should be using the middle of the field more. He was passing up easy middle of the field throws last year. That could be Getzy, that could be him, but he needs to be uh, put in a system and an infrastructure to do that. He he led the NFL in most out-of-pocket throws last year at almost 30%. Um, took the longest time to throw in Stand the NFL down. last year. And I just think that, like, I, I've said this a million times, but, like, geography is destiny for young quarterbacks. Three years ago, being drafted by the Bears was a disaster. Um, hopefully, it's not a disaster anymore for Caleb Williams, but we've seen what that that looks like. And I think oftentimes we – I think more often teams fail prospects than prospects fail teams. Um, but I also think that sometimes we don't know until they get out of it, whether or not that that right. was the case. And so um, I, I'm sorry, sorry to cut you off, but I agree with you on all of that stuff um, about how the situation matters more. And there are obviously aberrations where it's not completely true. However, the thing that I have a hard time with, and I think it was probably a few months ago that Charlie called me out on this is we don't have a great example of, a quarterback who was a highly drafted player going somewhere else and then fully reaching his potential. The problem is if we believe that those first stops can really ruin a person's career, we have, we have very few examples of them ever having their career resurrected. Uh, is it, do you, because of the flashes he showed, do you not consider Baker Mayfield that? Yeah, and that's the no. I, I was don't. actually, I think the the where we started the discussion was with Baker Mayfield. Yeah, I, I don't think. Ba- no, I'm I mean, saying that's yeah. not an example. Yeah. No, I I, I don't. Okay. So like Baker was the number one pick. Like, yeah, I, I think that when you're drafting someone, you're expecting them to eventually be like a top of the league quarterback. Like we got a chance because mm-hmm. this guy is there. And I guess that's my thing is we have not seen those quarterbacks. And I would agree with you that the reason why we haven't seen it was because of where they started. But can they, do they get the time, the yeah. uh, the attention or the habits that they built up wrong? Will it ever pan out? Because that's what scares me about Justin Fields is yeah. like, is it too late? And so, so is, that's, uh, you sorry, made a great point, Fox. I'm sorry. You made, you made a great point, which is that they don't get the time and attention in the next stop. That's part of the reason they don't flourish is because there's no executive saying you have to play this guy. Right. There's no coach saying we're not benching this guy. We love this guy. They're basically like a lot of times those guys who are like top 15 picks who end up with the second team. A lot of times they're in competitions at their second right. stop for the third stop. Um, it's very rare for somebody to say, okay, we're trading for this guy. He didn't work Lean out in his first spot and we're going to give him a long leash here. It does not happen. And so a lot of times in order to have a, a average NFL career, you need someone advocating for you saying, this is my guy. And after the first stop, it very rarely happens. What do you guys think Justin Fields ceiling actually is? Because he hasn't progressed that much as a passer in the last three years. His, his flash games are when he's a yeah. dominant runner and has some, you know, the tough thing explosives, about, but his yeah. stats are near the bottom of the league at every single passing category. He was a great passer in college. Yep. It's like he does. It would be, it'd be a much easier assessment to make if we were hoping that he would develop into a passer. It seems like he's regressed as a passer. And I think that's what gives anybody who has hope for him is like, no, they ruined him. We know he can do this. And it's not about, can we teach him something that he's never done before? It's, and I understand college, whatever is different, but like with Olave Wilson, JSN, Marvin Harrison Jr., Fine, yeah, fine. No, but I mean, I think uh, no Marvin Harrison. Yeah, he, no, he wasn't there yet. But I mean, they had the equivalent Jameson of Williams. A, a NFL or better than most NFL team Way caliber better. receiver cores. So yeah, I get that. But I think it's more about, and maybe it's accuracy issues, but it's more about 
the guys who we talk about that normally are guys that we haven't seen do it at all, no matter who their receivers were. We're like, can you? Can we teach them something? He knows how to do it. He just hasn't done it yet. And maybe it's because I, those receivers aren't good enough. I don't know. I think part of it, first of all, I, I believe he and DJ Moore had some of the best stats, quarterback to wide receiver in football last year. But then beyond that, like, there were no easy throws in that offense last year. Yeah. He led the NFL in deep shots by a wide margin, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, I just felt like there could have been more layups in that offense. I just didn't see any. And I saw some Bears people have been like, well, he was passing up the layups. Like, okay, well, don't let him do that. Like, just just get it in, get it into him. He has to take uh, the middle of the field when it's open. And, and I think that there are structural changes that can make him a lot better and raise his floor, and then the ceiling comes along with it. I need a, um, a, a pithy way to say this so that I remember it, because I think this is another thing that we forget is when we reference things that have never happened in the NFL or that have happened in the NFL, I think we forget that it is a closed ecosystem mm -hmm. and it's only 32 teams so that – if there is something that is conventional wisdom, then it becomes the conventional wisdom. And then it like is a self-fulfilling prophecy and that because we haven't. And so to, I, I guess I'm undercutting my point that we've never seen a quarterback bounce back like that. Jim Plunkett. But, yeah. Okay. Jim Plunkett's your best example. Um, because we haven't seen that, it's might be more a product of the way that the coaches think and approach yeah. it. It's not like they live. It's not like, well, Steve Young doesn't count. It's not like they live outside in a truly free market where you get relegated if you stink. And so that you are more like um, encouraged to try riskier methods. Anyway, just, just completely dismissing Johnny Ninus being cut. Mm. Okay. I'm talking about football guys, <laughs> which is like things that happen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, like post 93, you know, free Nine, agent. Post hour cap. Yeah. yeah. I like that type of stuff uh, after. Yeah. So uh, before we move on to our last one, I will say that if I was the GM, I would, we talk about prophecies. The prophecy that is the most fun is Baker Mayfield, just hopping from NFL, NFC South team to NFC South team and just feeding all of the number one options and although, then going to the next one. Uh, didn't, didn't he already try it at Carolina? Yeah, this would be number three. Yeah, right. I know. I'm I mean, just I, but, that but, it didn't work it, there. You're suggesting that it's going to work everywhere. But the reclamation project thing, like Bryce Young was the 38th best quarterback in the NFL by EPA last year. He's not the 38th most talented, but then new regime in Carolina. Are they as committed to him? And then you just end up in a quarterback competition like with I don't even know what the quarterback competition will be in three years, but uh, it'll be bleak. And Baker was also like, I don't want to take any credit from him, but we did point out the great receivers that Fields had in college. Like Baker was throwing it at Evans. <laughs> like, I mean, yep. it's obviously a different situation, but I, I don't know. I, I haven't done an extensive Baker Mayfield breakdown, so I, I don't want to like disparage his numbers this year, but I don't feel like there's going to be a crazy bidding war because Baker Mayfield has finally figured it out. That'd be the fun part because he is someone who feeds his number one option Ooh. in a way that Arthur oh, Smith refused oh. to let it happen. So yeah. it'd be like, all right, we can actually draft these guys in fantasy. A smart football. Give it to the good guys. All right, um, what's next? Yeah, I mean best coaches do they play their best players to get them the ball um last one if you were the gm of the eagles you were howie roseman <laughs> this is a florio bomb how would you feel knowing that the loss of big dom caused nick sirianni to spiral and become erratic oh, that's not true i don't believe it that's all right i, just, I won't speaking like, as little dom so <laughs> no one calls me dom except for occasionally kevin clark I'm not a dom. Do I look like a dom to you? No, but there's yeah. a big dom, little dom joke that's sitting it. there. Why well, is it funny? <laughs> Three, two, one. Um, <laughs> I, would, I would be embarrassed and I wouldn't take it seriously. It's not a real thing. Like Nick Sirianni does not need Are his you, giant teddy bear. Are you to sure come about down. that? <laughs> I well maybe right. maybe Kevin. I'm sure Kevin is not just gonna go off his feelings. He has some research or some uh, next gen stats that he can uh, he can um, use to support his opinion. But please agree with me. That. So I agree with you. Thank you. I, I think that it's not about like I it is very funny to me. So they get their <laughs> by the Niners and then the season starts to spiral. And obviously he's gonna have confrontations because the entire like his job is on the line. The team just couldn't even do anything in a playoff game when they started out maybe as NFC favorites in as probably as late as October. And so he's just fighting with everybody because they suck. And then someone in the Eagles organization looks at this and says, oh, this is because Big Dom isn't here. Like, what? How, how do you 
do get so lost Smart. in the correlation causation the timeline here that you're like, oh, the, the team can't score. Yeah, Big Don is can, not the I reason. I can tell you. each other over okay. that. But but the reason we're all a little on edge is because Big Dom is in here to defuse the situation. If I'm Howie Roseman and I'm looking down at Nick Sirianni and I'm like, this man pr- promoted Matt Patricia to be the defensive coordinator. Oh. If he's that erratic and he's flipping people off on the sideline of the Super Bowl, he's yelling at fans, telling him, see, I'm thinking there has to be something missing here. If Patricia finally gets the job. And you got to point to the one factor that changed. Okay. And that's that's not big the dumb. one factor that changed. But also, like, I imagine that Kevin has heard the same thing that I've heard. But uh, the Matt Patricia uh, edition was not a Nick Sirianni idea from what I understand. But either way, neither here nor there. Take some steam out of that fun part of it. <laughs> I mean, it's just all <laughs> foolishness. It was a fun way to end our football discussion on a silly topic like Big Dom. Big Dom they wasn't getting crossed no up way. in the open field against uh, uh, the Cardinals. That wasn't Big Dom's fault. Big Dom wasn't the reason why they didn't have answers for the blitz. That ain't on Big Dom. These are, Big Dom's not the reason why they didn't get those sacks anymore. I think it is interesting. If you leave Big Dom out of it, the conversation that is fairly interesting is his first year as a head coach, they had no problems. They had no yep. injuries. They had no setbacks. Nothing major to throw them off. This The thing that's interesting is this year they had a lot of problems. And you could argue that this is a, a knock on Sirian as a coach. I don't think that the reason why they had problems was because the security dude wasn't around. It's just he made Nick Sirianni comfortable. No. You know make Nick Sirianni comfortable? Have, are healthy Wait players ahead. who are dominating. <laughs> who, who, uh, who have ended the game the before the start of the fourth quarter? There's nobody yell at when you're up by 14 at uh, uh, with 15 minutes to go. The other the other part of that tweet it was all one tweet. It was a newsy tweet. Was that Jalen Hurts couldn't respond to the pressure of the contract, which is again funny because for two months he did. And and also, as someone who has been in a contract year. Ain't no pressure after it. Yeah. The pressure is before it. He played his best game <laughs> with the most pressure-packed moments. That's when there's pressure. I mean, I'm sure there's pressure after, too. But if he existed in the pressure before the contract, I'm pretty sure he can exist in the pressure after it. Foxworth, can you give me the number one thing you did in a contract year that you wouldn't have done any other year? Um. Well, I got traded. So, like, mm. um, that really made things really easy. I got traded on week one. And so I had to live out of a hotel for a lot of the time and didn't know anybody in Flowery Branch, Atlanta. So all the things that could have been a problem for me were not a problem. I mostly just tried to cope with the minor depression that I was dealing with. Hmm. That's also a very grim suburb. It is not near anything. Oh, you know what was also grim? So I got traded. I told Champ first. And um, he was like, I just want to let you know that you're not going to be in Atlanta. And if you're not in Atlanta, you're in Georgia. And I was like, I don't know what the hell that means, but okay, appreciate <laughs> you, brother. I'll hit you up. Let's get together at all season. <laughs> then I get there and I drive out the flowery branch um, and I notice pickup trucks with Confederate flags on them, multiple. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm in Georgia. <laughs> I don't want to be in Georgia. That was fun. All right. Rose and Thorns. Thanks, Kevin. You're the man. See you next time. See you guys. Has Dominique been lately? Bad or good? Let's find out. This is Roses and Thorns. Time for your favorite segment, my favorite person, the return of Roses and Thorns. We hadn't had a chance to do this in a while. A lot of traveling, a lot of moving parts. So Maybe I just didn't want to hang out with him. <laughs> yeah, right. We've been hanging out a little bit. Watch, <laughs> we watched... Uh, I love hanging Like Literally, I just want to lay on his chest or back. All but day and night long. I love watch, hanging out with him. We watch shows together. So we watch Mr. and, and Mrs. And I don't Smith. care what's on as long I know, as I can lay on his back. I'm happy. That's or the chest. weird thing is mm-hmm. like you're not watching the shows. I've actually seen all of Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I can tell uh, you everything. I can tell you everything. Well, we don't want to spoil it for anybody who wants to watch it. It was surprisingly good. I didn't... Even some of you don't fully engage in any of it though. Like you're always Whoa. half on your phone or reading a book. Because I'm or really something. smart and I can do a lot of things at once. That doesn't. That's not a sign of intelligence necessarily. Being able to do mm, a lot of things at once. Yeah, it is. I mean, it depends do a on lot it. of things well. Like I am fully engaged. I fully am mastering connections and Wordle and Spelling Bee and all my other New York Times games I play. Sometimes I open up my books and start reading while I'm watching it. I can do all those things well at once. So, um, it doesn't mean I'm dumb. 
I didn't say you were dumb. I know, but, but I'm just saying, like, it's not not a sign of intelligence. I mean, it's also multitasking is like a myth, all right? Isn't it? You have to actually focus on one thing or the other. You can't really. You say not if this, you have a brain that lets you do a lot of things well at once. You say this, but it's not actually true. So, like, if you have the remote and you start talking to me, you stop changing channels. Yeah, I actually don't anything. care about or what if, I'm watching. Oh, no. I mean, if you are, I, when we're on the phone, I can tell when you've started to do something Because else. I'm over the conversation with him. Well, then uh, you're if not I'm into my book and I'm into the show and I'm into your listening to your heartbeat laying on your chest and or I'm into connections. I admittedly didn't get right. it two nights ago. Last that's night. A, that's exactly the point I'm making. You are into one of these things. You're no, never if I'm into, into all of them, I'm getting all never. of them done at the same time. If I'm into them, if I'm over the conversation with you and my text got a little more interesting, no offense. Or if I like am not really that interested in the show that you've chosen. Like, yes, the other thing I'm doing might, like, predominate. You did it in the shows that you choose, too. So, uh, um, Love is Blind. I haven't been watching this season. But it'll take. Oh, so, I hate that title <laughs> because I always think of the Eve song about getting abused. Love oh, is fine. It'll yeah. take. Oh. And then, from there, I think of the Babyface and Stevie Wonder one, How Come, How Long. And I get kind of sad about it, but I also love Love is Blind. Is it a good season? I, I only know yes. the, the part Next about Next season's the... in D.C., guys. We might know some people. Oh, God. That's not encouraging. <laughs> Except for I won't because I'm too old. Uh, there's no one my age on Love is Blind. There, um, I know about the like Megan Fox person who says she like Megan Fox, mm, and I, I saw her. because she doesn't look like Megan Fox. Yeah, is that so? I, the one thing that I thought about last night when I was watching that one, or the and end I paid of full episode. attention. What are you talking about? Yeah, I played my games and I paid full attention. I, Love is Blind. I cooked dinner while watching Love is Blind. I played my games. Anyway, go I mean, ahead. Love is Blind doesn't require that much attention. Exactly, that's why the, I chose that one. <laughs> the, 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 the like middle three episodes of Love, three or four episodes of Love is Blind are always like the same episode over and over really? again. Really? But anyway, I was making a broader point about the concept of Love is Blind because I was thinking about this and that this woman, and the way that I understand it, you might be able to explain it better to me, but this guy was kind of choosing between two women. Uh, Love is Blind is the, the, the construct of the Isn't show. Like the white guy with the haircut? I guess so. I and mean, with Megan Fox, the one who yeah, yeah, Megan that's Fox. like the concept of the show or She's the conceit of Fox. the show is that there's you he can't. He says words like conceit to try to show that he's smart, y'all. That's not why. It's just the proper word to use. <laughs> he's so smart. Yet I said a hotel room was well appointed the other day, and he looked at me like I was nuts. Anyway, go ahead, babe. I didn't look at you like you were nuts. Like he looked at me like he wanted to learn from me. You seem like you missed roses and thorns. You had a mm -hmm. lot of pent up words. Like I'm, I'm trying to actually get to some <laughs> go ahead, legitimate go ahead, topics. Go ahead, get on to your topics. I was saying that the conceit of the show is that you can't see the person for those people who don't know mm -hmm. and so he before you propose to them and so he had two people and one of them was conventionally very attractive and the other one was less so the one who was less so said suggested that she looked like megan fox and she does not look like megan fox and he ended up with the one that was somewhat less attractive but it had me um thinking about how people like kind of misleading at the beginning of all relationships so like it feels like we're piling on this person because she obviously doesn't look like megan fox but isn't that what we all kind of do is where you trying to like a job interview you put your best foot forward early on and then eventually you're like all right i not quite as perfect as i suggested i was yes stumped well, he told me to stop talking so much, so I stopped talking so Never much. Never said stop talking so much. <laughs> um, yes, but in like a conventional circumstance, like you're getting to know each other, and it's like you also have like the realistic data. Like, like if we were dating, and I told you I look just like Halle Berry, but you saw me, you're like, eh, okay, or like I had Nicki, we dated before Nicki Minaj, but like I had Megan the Style, you know, Nicki Minaj's butt, like you'd be like, eh, but I can see it, and it's just not there. Um, in this instance, and like, you know, yes, maybe Perfect you couldn't confirm or deny, like, if I told you, like, oh, I'm so ambitious, I'm going to rule the world one day, like, you would have just taken me maybe stupidly at my word, but like, but all oh, perfect side, he's lying, it's not, but thank you, babe. Um, but, um, but in this instance, it's like, they have no way of knowing anything about what the person looks like. So to say I look like Megan Fox, but I think she actually, I didn't see that this makes it sound like he's right about what he's saying, that I don't pay attention to shows. I just was also like not literally in the room as some of it was on. So I missed that part where she actually said it. But what I read was she said that like she conceded that like it really wasn't uh, true. But other people think that about her. Right, but she um, knew what she was doing. Yes. And she knew what she was doing. I'm sorry. Take that out. <laughs> she don't look nothing like Ray. Her like it maybe. I mean, she I can see same where she's eyes. going with it. <laughs> like or the same like the sharpness of the face. Uh, but like maybe she looks like two Megan Foxes. Um, like and not wrong. doubly attractive, but yeah. doubly Megan Foxy. 
Um, but so the other girl who was really attractive, at least in the parts they show, of course, there's editing, didn't say anything about her appearance until it was obvious that he was not choosing her. Then she was like, oh, you were going to need your EpiPen <laughs> when you see. And I was like, well, it won't be an allergic Epi-pen. reaction. Allergic? But so, no, but her point was like, you were going to like go into anaphylactic, you're into uh, shock, maybe not uh, anaphylactic, but you're going to go into shock when you see how great I look. And she didn't say compared to the other person, but like that was implied. But I thought it was classy of her to not say compared to the other person. And then until, she came, until, well, she never she said never did. To and then she kept being like, she was like, they are great. She is great. She's lovely, yeah. not taking anything away. But you know he'll want me. And I was like, you know what, girl, talk your sh- because you are very attractive. But I, um, yeah. So I, but but so I guess just my point is that in those instances, like I think that's unfair because he cannot see her at all. So like to say, but I think the point that you made is an interesting one in that the the. Like being ambitious, like the internal things are the things that we end up describing all the time because like no one sees those things. You are like trying to present who you are or who you're going to be. The fact that this one is different because you don't see their appearance, I think makes it more obvious. But to be honest, I think that it's something that we all do all the time. And to be fair to um, (laughs) Megan Fox, I don't know what we're calling her, fake Megan Fox. Why did he ask? Like the whole point of the I don't exercise. Know. Did he ask though? I don't. Oh, I, I thought, don't know. I, 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 don't I know thought if he that asked. he asked. Is there Another any celebrity guy, that you the, look like? Oh, right? maybe that so. Was I don't the know. Question. The black guy, Clay, There's did only try one? to. Well, the well, there are two actually. The black guy who ended up with the black girl, but um, but the black couple, um, the male in that couple, Clay, did try to ask the girl like what he what she looked like, and I respect her for that because she's not unattractive. Like she's a great body and like a fine face, like. Apparently, people have talked about her install, and I don't notice stuff like that. Like, I'm not a big hair person, but apparently her... Is that a wig? Or, or weave? Yeah, weave. Mm-hmm. And apparently, it wasn't great in the show. Like, I'm uh-huh. like, I don't notice it. I mean, I imagine but you it, have it's to better go. now. And like, apparently, she posts, right. like, I got it fixed. Because you're there. You're I stuck mean, there. Yeah. You can't get it. Yeah, I yeah. don't imagine But I didn't got, notice that it looked bad, if I'm being a, honest. A weaveologist. Um, I don't believe they have one at the no, Love is Blind campus. I didn't notice it looked bad. Weirdly, they all keep fresh nails. So I'm like, do they have a manicure yeah, coming Probably. That's a lot easier. But I know you sound like culture specific. Um but he asked her, and she was really taken aback by it. And she was like, no, this is not the point of this experiment. Yeah, like, that's, I you, respect that. And, like, yeah, she went in, and at first it seemed like she was, like, over it with him, over him. I have him. a question for you. If you were in the Love is Blind thing, oh God, people would, would you, I would have no matches. People would be over no, I think, me. I think people would match with you, but would you? I hope he would, but I think no one would. I would absolutely match with you. <laughs> uh, my oh, question was going to be. Would you ask if they were black, or you would just assume that you could tell by their voice? You can hear it in their voice. Yeah, I would think. AD, the one who, the black woman who matched with the black guy in the end really thought that, like, she's like, because I have kind of a soft voice and people don't know. I'm like, what in your every sentence with period? Like, like, you are obviously black. Like, and not even just from her. And yes, I think that ultimately talking to her for more than, like, you know, like five minutes, she would hear it in her voice. But I could see what she said. She was like, my voice, sometimes people can't tell. Um, But she was very obviously black. Like, the way she talked, like, the references she made. Sometimes, though, I wonder if white people pick up on references that as a black person, you know are black. Like, yeah. I would think that a white per- man would know that, like, when she's ending all her sentence with period, like, that she's uh, black. I don't know. I feel but, like a lot of, like, at least now, because of social media and all this other stuff, like, slang gets co-opted so quickly. I know. <laughs> I feel like ending sentence in period doesn't mean that you're black. I uh, sent a, uh, um... I, 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 I mean, I feel like I can tell by, like... Tone and inflection. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, so and I not think, necessarily by so references. So I wouldn't ask because I think I the would references know. I think you would miss. But I do think I would listen for it. Like, because, and this girl and another person who ended up with a, a him, white Uno, woman. What Uno rules do you play by? <laughs> like, how, how would you t- No, and the white guy asked her, like, what type of music she likes. She's like, R&B and hip hop. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, we don't. Like, we're but done. no, but some white people yeah. like R&B and hip hop, but like that on top of her but voice no, and I ending sentences with if period. You, if you say like, it in a dismissive way, if someone asks me what type of music I listen to, I'm like, hip hop. Like, obviously. Yeah. Well, no, she was like he was like oh i like rock and she was like i mean i, I know some 80s rock which is like more than i know but nah, you um, know some rock songs I feel not like. rock I, you, i'll do pop 2000s pop all day i, I can't do like 80s rock like i can't do rock. rolling stone you had like a rolling stone oh, that song, one song that you like. she's a rainbow because i'm like like colorful things since she's a rainbow it's a good song guys but now that I listen to it, I think that it might be like have like sexual connotations that I didn't. Of course it does. To Rolling Stones. And I oh, went no, ahead and got a sweater roll- with it written on the back. <laughs> not because it's Rolling Stones, but like 
Is it like she comes in color everywhere? Yeah. Is it like eighty yeah. percent of music? Like, well, I didn't realize. Yeah, I just thought I it was like, like this woman just is running around, and there's a rainbow of color behind her. That's how you I pictured take it, it. Literally, oh, maybe that's how you pictured it. Like in it, my mind, like, it's like that's what I saw, and I was like, this is so beautiful. Like that's you, me. I'm a rainbow. I, I, I used to love her um, uh, old common song that was used a uh, woman as the metaphor for hip hop, and it's a really good song. But he kind of think most of your it. audience knows it. Probably not. He probably, you don't think so? I don't know. We'll find out. He kind of ruins it at the end because then he says, the girl I'm talking about is hip hop. It's like, we know. Well, like <laughs> Homecoming in Chicago. I, I mean, Homecoming Kanye West, which we can be here nor there oh, about yeah, Kanye. Yeah, yeah. We don't talk about him anymore. But oh, no, anyway, about him. the original version was John Legend. Remember that version? It never made it to an album. And then he redid it on an album with Chris Martin. The John Legend version is where it's at. Finding it on YouTube. It's so much better. But in the end, like I was listening to it with the kids the other day. Not that I'm still listening to Kanye or anything. It just happened to come You're on. You're allowed to listen to Kanye. <laughs> <laughs> It did just happen to come on, though, in my 2000s playlist. Yeah. Um, and um, Avery was like, oh, this, what is he talking about? Because he's describing a girl, yeah. and it's kind of like following that common mold. Um, but then it, and he says, like, look, I'm talking about Shy town And I was like, oh, like, and Avery yeah. got it. And I was like, just keep him guessing, Kanye. Yeah, I know. I feel like it's better I mean, if you don't tell it. not that it wasn't obvious. But, but, but. Yeah, I mean, because I used to love her as obvious, too, another Chicago rapper. But anyway, uh, you brought up music in Avery. She is into really old music, and she also is, like, uh, into, like, music explainer videos so she's bringing me old songs and and old beefs and asking and explaining to me stuff that i grew up on but i remember we listened to music that was uh offensive and not really or not even offensive but suggestive and not really knew what they were talking about we were kids but thanks to youtube and and rap genius avery is 13 and she knows exactly what the music she listens to i know this one, I don't even actually know what this song is about, but Which she one? she had the thuggish, ruggish bone playing <laughs> in the car. And she was like, I don't know. I heard it on a YouTube video, and I liked it, especially the beginning of it. And I'm not against rap. I'm not against rappers. But I am against those thugs. Uh, thugs. You got to echo it. <laughs> it um, yeah, let's, let's genius it with her. Um, we will. We'll cool. have to figure it out. This was fun. Hold on. No, I'm not done. Oh, you're not? I uh, have... A thorn. Uh, a thorn, yes. I know what this thorn is going to be. It's going to be about me. I have not a rose. Being, I have a rose. Not being able to socialize. No, it's not that. Oh. I think, honestly, I, this is a rose for you. The rose is he went to Super Bowl. I didn't go. I stayed here with the kids. And, like, I really, pardon me. Why like, would I you sh- go? Like, you said it like you. Like, <laughs> because I said, told y'all I was going to see I Usher. Went, I went to work. You said I went to Super Bowl and I stayed with I the kids. I told y'all I was going to see Usher oh, and gosh. I failed. I did not go see Usher. And then I felt like, like, you know, the Drake phrase, like shooting in the gym, like Mm -hmm. my shooting in the gym would have been if I went with him to force him to socialize, like, because I I know. So your rose is because like Dominique doesn't go to parties and so much socializing and like networking that's like probably good for his industry happens at like parties at like these events, like Super Bowl parties and whatever. And so I was like, I need to show up there so I can drag his behind to these parties and make him network and meet people. Charlie, thank you, Charlie Kravitz. Um, The vanilla snack got him out in these streets. Um, And he called me on the way to the airport. We didn't talk that much because I was busy here and he was busy there. And he called me. He was like, I made a lot of good connections. Um, He's like, yeah, because I went out. And I was like, oh, my. And he said it kind of like shocked. And I was like, oh, my God. Pray tell. Socializing and meeting people can actually be good for you. What? So that's a rose for him and for Charlie for getting him to do it but a thorn is this and we he was at a conference actually here in DC so convenient conference um an event a couple nights ago and I went to the just the that event with him obviously I didn't go to like the whole conference with him um but I went to this event with him and we were like there were two floors of it and we were on the bottom floor about to exit and he was like all right I think I've done a good job I've talked to people talked to so many he did he tried guys and I was like it's okay like and I was like well maybe like you know you should try to talk to a little bit more people and like socialize and the only way I could get him back upstairs if I was like oh you know the airbrush station like they had people airbrushing t-shirts it's like an activity or whatever um or in like a takeaway from the event I said, let's go get T-shirts made. So we went, and we got these. I'm stripping, but only to my T-shirt. Ooh. Ooh. It's Ow. almost sexy. People going to get on these. YouTube for this one. <laughs> no, you won't, guys. I'm wearing an airbrush shirt. It says, and he told me to pick what it said, and this is one of the samples. So I got Ashley and Damo with a heart airbrush. It's so cute. And I, when he told me he wanted to do Rose and Thorns again this week after, I said, oh, we can wear our matching shirts. Y'all, if you're looking, he looks cute, but he's not wearing his Damo Hearts Ashley shirt. But guess what? I'm wearing mine. You're wearing a ring. <laughs> what more do I, a ring uh, amongst many other diamonds, I, I think, is enough. 
Here, honey, you can put it on now. I think the diamonds are enough to suggest it's much more to the shirt. I had an airbrush shirt when I was in high school. Oh, me too. I have like several still in my drawers that I think I'm just going to take out. Mine was cooler. I can't. I have equipment on, so I'll just do this for Damo you. Damo hearts Ashley. Guys, he loves me. That's what his shirt I know. says. Of course, you don't need a cheap <laughs> airbrush shirt to say it. I'm going to lay on his chest tonight and listen the, to his heart beating and hear that love. The diamond on your left hand should be enough. And all the other things that I provide as a good husband and father, not this goofy t-shirt but anyway it's beautiful i love it thank you guys for making and it made him socialize a bit longer so huh? Did it? it's like a my kill two birds with one stone my high school t-shirt was a lot cooler i have a really cute ashley one from when i was from the boardwalk at some point when I I was was a our, kid. Uh, our whole football team got a mate corny we were corny this is not cool. corny though this is cute and aside why are you folding it up like you're I thought not we were going... done okay keep it on to the yeah, end yeah keep it on to the right. end Thank you. Another great show. We got to win again, Charlie. We're undefeated. Long winning streak. All right. Thank you, Charlie, for being my great producer and co-host. Thank you to Megan, Serafina, Kevin, Brian, and Tez, and Damo Hearts, Ashley, <laughs> and Podville. We out. <laughs> this is the Dominique Foxworth Show.